No! No! Welcome, everybody, to the first episode of the Ghibli Cast. I am your host, Digibro, and today joining me is the Devu. Hello. Uh, no. Hypocrite. Hey, it's me, Hypocrite, a resident Chibi Baka, signing in from your mother's bedroom. And Munchie J. Trump. Another fucking podcast? No, God, I shouldn't even be here. I already have one anime podcast. This is too much, and I don't even want to be here. I don't want to be here. Well, this is primarily going to be a podcast that I and probably Devu will be on every episode because he expressed interest, um, but we're going to have just whoever wants to be on can be on. We're watching all of the Ghibli movies in order of release, and right away I have to address the fact before anybody fucking comments. Yeah. But um, actually, Nasuka is not actually a Ghibli movie. People think it was, but it came out before the founding of oh, Ghibli Studios. Eat a- Eat an egg, you fucking retard. I mean, it's the most convenient way to think of it. If you go to... Even on the Wikipedia page, it's, like, listed right above the list of Ghibli films. It's like, by the way, you might as well think of this as one, but, like, it's technically not. But, you know, Ghibli owns all the rights to it, so it's a Ghibli movie. People who say Ghibli mean Hayao Miyazaki movies. That's what they mean, because it's the guy. Well, we're going to be watching all of Ghibli's movies because they are all great. And in Japan, Isao Takahata would be as much of a household name as Miyazaki probably. But uh, And he recently passed away, so this will also sort of be in his honor. <sighs> yeah. Um, but, yeah. Uh, anyways, this was the first one. It's a classic, very beloved, based on a manga also written by Miyazaki. But he was writing them both at the same time, and the movie just kind of ends at the place where the manga was at that moment, and then the manga keeps going. But, uh, you know, it's a, it's a fun, Isn't the Kira freewheeling similar? action adventure movie, I guess. What would you say? Isn't yeah, Akira is very similar. Yeah, so, they, so like, there's two anime movies from the 80s that adapt a manga by, directed by the same guy who did the manga that ends at the point that the manga was at that involves a giant blobby monster trying to do something and then just kind of falls apart. I think Akira was a little farther along in the manga before the anime movie came out, but yeah, both of them kind of had the same story, and uh, they both just kind of, yeah, like, take the some, some elements of the actual conclusion and just work them into whatever the story was at the time. Um, it is funny the way that they parallel each other that way. But, like, for starters, I just want to know what you guys each even thought of this movie. Because while there's tons of history and context and deep lore shit that I can get into, I'm sure people are going to expect that because I'm the anime guru here. I don't really want Ghibli cast to just be, like, a guy reading you everything about a Miyazaki film. Because, frankly, uh, Miyazaki movies are, are, I think, some of those things where people who love them won't shut up about how they're perfect and anyone who doesn't really get why is just like okay i just think they're boring because i used to think they were boring and uh munchie your reaction to this movie you seem to not really care for it all that much i wouldn't say that i have a negative opinion of the movie i wouldn't say that i dislike it at all it's just I don't give a shit about, like, basically anything about it. And it's a 10 out of 10. It's flawless. It, like, it's a masterpiece. It's made by Hao Miyazaki. I know that person. I don't know goddamn shit about anime. I don't know the first thing about a Shinji or a fucking American flag. I don't know any of that shit. Uh, but I do know that guy. And so, obviously, it's great. Ghibli Cast will just be, okay, obviously, this movie is good because it's made by a guy who everyone knows to be good. So, sure, I have complaints, but, like, who cares? Who cares? This this is a beloved movie. This is, like, oh, fucking, uh, you know, uh, Aladdin's bad or, like, Beauty and the Beast is bad. Like, who gives a fuck? No one, no one believes you. But why? You. I don't get it. Why don't you like it? It's just boring. I don't. I don't feel a connection to any of the characters. I don't. This this movie like excels so well and like oh wow, there's like a world outside of this movie that they it doesn't feel the need to like make me care about any of them because like oh there's a world outside of it. You've probably read the manga. You probably know what's going on. You probably you you probably care about these people. Just watch them go. But I don't care. Nasca's just Fluttershy. I've n- and I've then there's just mustache people, and I don't care. <laughs> 
Oh, that's I, fucking hilarious. <laughs> she is totally, though. I, so I don't want to come out as, like, the guy who doesn't like the movie, and everyone's like, why don't you like fucking Beauty and the Beast? It's a American staple. I, fucking, I, I just want to come out and say that I fucking hate Beauty and the Beast. I think that movie's boring as shit, and I don't get it. So, like, I'm on your... I'm on your level with this, mm-hmm. but even though I love this movie. I'm confused, mostly because I thought you would like the fucking sick bugs. Okay, no, I, I like the bugs. One of my notes here is that the if if the arms didn't have a great design, which I cherish and just think is genius, and every time I see them, I'm like, ah, oh, shock zone. But uh, if they didn't have that, I would have just fallen asleep and died. Well, hold on, hold on, Munchie. When I saw the arms, I thought, oh, wow, Super Metroid. The whole first scene and... Basically, every other scene in the movie made me think, uh, was Super Metroid, like, only 75% James Cameron's aliens and, like, maybe 25% this? Yeah, it's definitely, like... I've never played a single Metroid game. Like, specifically the Ohms, they feel like that, the like... The Ohms were an extremely influential design. Like, right. Miyazaki, you know, he's always been sort of heralded as, like, a god because he really descends from... What what was essentially, like, the Japanese equivalent of Disney, the Toei studio, you know, like, the people who were making the real big budget anime films, and, like, Ghibli kind of is, like, the, the, they were, like, the next step to try to make it, like, more cinematic and, like, actually well-directed. And, yeah, like, actual you know, paced. About the pacing, though, and also relation to what uh, Munchie said about not caring, I was very struck by the whole, like, first 15 minutes that's just character walks into a world building level and then just ex- exposition dumps shit before anyone hugs they copied that uh they they wholesale copied the start of this movie in fucking the Star Wars episode 7 well that one starts with like emotional moments first it starts with like a village getting burned but yeah then oh yeah i don't mean to say that it starts the same way just yeah, but that, then like, they the have scene like, of her girl going down and through the ship and everything yeah but, like, but what's unique about this one is it doesn't start with, the way like... the shots are framed. You're normally accustomed to, like, first you're going to see, like, the little kids of the town going, you know, go, you know, get, go, go, go get them. Don't, like, die for my sake. You're supposed to, like, get an emotional attachment first. This movie just, like, kind of starts off with the biggest uninterrupted moment of just, like, nerdy world-building shit, which actually then kind of undercut me when the rest of it was kind of a, you know, a, not a terribly dynamically different eco-terrorism affair of like, you know, I speak for the trees kind of shit, you know? It became a much more normal yeah. story after 10 minutes. Does the original, like 1976 or whenever it came out, Lord X Animation have any Japanese staff behind it? Because I would unironically be on for the Lord X cast because that is one of my favorite pieces of media of all time. Just side note, you continue what you were saying. <laughs> the Dr. Seuss cast? Yeah, I could do that. A, a Seuss cast would be interesting. Like, I, I would, I have no interest, but, like, I'd watch it if someone did it. So there's an encouragement somewhere if you're a Seuss fan out there. Get on it. Yeah, so what are we going to talk about, like, the visuals, the sounds, the, the themes, well, the background? Well, I haven't background? said what I like. Oh, true. Uh, whether I like it. And I, I fucking love, I fucking love this movie. And the last time I saw it, it inspired me in, like, it gave me a lot of, like, creative inspiration for, like, various things and a love of bugs and yeah. and, and mushrooms and stuff. And watching it again, I'm like, this is great. This is the perfect thing. This is one of my favorite movies. I, I'm, I'm so glad. I've got, like, the perfect palette of impressions here because, like, like... Hippo, the way you react is, like, how the people who I think who really speak for this movie, like, feel about it, you know? Like, lots of artists, lots of people who draw fan art of this, who... It, it's, it's like, a long-standing Artist Alley kind of movie because it has such a specific aesthetic, and obviously there's the strong female protagonist, which even, you know... In Japan, they've always celebrated, like, female protagonists, but the more that it's celebrated in the West, the more we look back to Ghibli movies and, like, those trend into Tumblr the, and become, you know... The way I would, like, here. Uh, like describe, the, like, um, Nausicaa's appeal is, like, that of Journey, the video game on PS3 and PS4. Interesting. Where it's, it's just a really cool-looking place, and there's not much happening, and it's very slow. Um... And you just walk from one place to the to, to to the next, and then you get to the end. And there's no dialogue. There's no nothing. It, the feeling is very much of like an aesthetic journey. You're just sort of yeah. taking in 
all these vistas and 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 water colored backgrounds and uh, dynamic shots of flying things well isn't that nice yeah and uh, i mean munchie mentioned in his notes that he didn't really care for the aesthetic so i mean that's like that's... losing half the battle right out the gate yeah, yeah. I, it's I, very I... much one of those I feel like such an asshole, like being the guy, that's the person that's like, you know, I didn't think this movie was perfect, even though uh, it is perfect. That's my official statement. My That's my official political statement. Uh, quote well, this in all of your magazines. It was a tamped in. Uh, but I feel like bad because it's just like, again, to go back to what I was saying before, like, oh, fucking Aladdin, the pacing's all off. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that guy. I feel like... I feel like a dick. I don't want. I don't right, well, want to be the bad. Guy. I, I think I, it's okay. I'm gonna help you with your feelings right now because I'm actually gonna come out and say that this movie, I've I've scored this movie a nine out of ten, and the funny thing about it is that I think it's a. I think as a movie, it's kind of terrible because huh. it has no ending. Like it just stops. It doesn't answer most of the questions. It's like okay, Kusharna has, like, a very minor arc, and then it's just kind of abandoned as a character. It's like, she shows up, she's a bitch, she's like, uh, you know, and then Nasca saves her, and then she just kind of is in captivity up until the moment she gets out the god warrior at the end, and she just kind of feels like a, stark vil- a stock villain archetype. In the manga, she's one of the main characters. She has a huge arc, there's, like, a whole major battle she loses. By the way, the manga is, like a Game of Thrones-esque, like, epic, like, or, or Lord of the Rings-esque epic, like, fantasy. So, oh. you know, this is like reading the first... This is like if you watched the Lord of the Rings and you stopped, like, 30 minutes before the end of the first movie. I see. Is basically how much of, like, the manga is covered here. Well, yeah, I definitely... As soon as this, the first scene begins and she starts, like, vertical slicing a bunch of the, the bio lore, I'm like, okay, clearly this is not going to... I, I didn't expect to get, like, some massive conclusion. I was expecting to get sort of, like, here's a sample for the manga, you know? And, I mean, it's not as though the manga was already complete at the time, you know? It was ongoing, too, so... Like, the rest of the story just wasn't told yet in any real form, so it's just kind of like, here's where the movie ends and you'll have to go read I the I do actually think, you know, when you hear things like how an anime adaptation is basically pitched as a as a little spoon sample for the manga, as like a really, like a really spruced up, colored up, voiced up rendition of some of it, I think that's, that's not like something disposable or something to see as, as negative. Uh, I'm reminded of a... Okay, so like, there's that there's this game design book, the 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 book of lenses, the art of game design by Jesse Scheel, who says back in the day when graphics were bad, you'd have to have a really densely detailed illustrated cover, or even in an arcade, a very illustrated uh, cabinet, to give people an idea of the aesthetic of what the graphics are supposed to be. Then you sort of use your imagination. And he compared it to uh, going to an old theater show. People way up in the back would get out little uh, goggles to see what all the costumes looked like up close, but they'd only do it for like a minute now that they know what the costumes look like they can just put the goggles down and their imagination you know fills in the details so you can sort of think of watching the movie as like here's what the manga is kind of supposed to be like right so here's a, here's a fully like packed in sample because you're just not going to get the full story in animated form nine times out of ten so it i feel like it still enhances the manga you know what's weird about that is that I constantly forget that there's a manga, and this movie doesn't make me care about looking into anything. Like, I just like it as it is. I think that's the funny thing about it, though, is that the movie removes elements from the manga that would have made it, like, feel open-ended. Like, they wanted this movie to feel like a complete experience so that, you know, it would stand the test of time and be a, a classic film. But as a result, it yeah, it doesn't make you curious because there's a lot of, like... Uh, it's fascinating to read the manga because I, I had volume one with me while I was watching the movie this time. And basically, like, the first good 15, 20 minutes are, like, a one-to-one exactly the same. But then when the in- invasion happens, that's when it starts diverging because, like, in that scene, th- the bad guys show up and they just kill her father. In the manga, her dad doesn't die for, like, three volumes. So, like... It was just a way to expediate this element of the conflict and, like, write this character out of the story because he doesn't really have a payoff 
until a point that the manga hasn't even gotten to yet. So, like, we'll just have him die so that that's not an open thread. But as a result, he's not an interesting character because nothing's happened with him. So you're just like, okay, well, her dad died, I guess. I, I kind of feel like there's that a way lot of stuff like that. about literally every character. I don't feel like I have a sense for anything about them. And, and it's not even like I demand, you know, it, you know, uh, uh, high like narrative stakes or like like you know character arcs that uh, just blow my mind or anything. It's not like I, like I'm an American audience who just needs high action because there's a lot of like explosions and shit here. I just feel like there's no whimsy and there's nothing interesting that's going on that's making me care even about these people. I I'm fine with having shallow caricatures if they're just interesting to me and if you know they're potent and vivid. But I just feel like these guys are just like vaguely good. And there are people who are vaguely bad. That describes most movies, though, IMHO. If you were to read the manga, it would feel more like almost a political epic. It's much more of a message piece because, like, immediately after where the movie ends, they introduce the other country that the people are at war with. Because this whole movie, there's this backdrop of, like, this kingdom is at war with this other kingdom and they are oppressing the Valley of the Wind because of this like war effort but we never see anything about the war, the 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 actual war or who they're fighting with right after this point in the manga is where we'd be introduced to those guys which is a fully religious society which Davu you even had notes about how the re- like lack of religion was like interesting in this society but like the manga then immediately introduces a fully religious society that's like clearly supposed to be um muslim and, oh, um, I'm not talking about the the religion of the movie society. I'm talking about our society's religion. Is what that oh, okay. is what I'm gonna yeah. Is what I'm what I, what I took out of this because I was I totally agree with what Munchie was saying. I guess okay. Here's how it is. Here's the thing about movies and when like nerds of our particular persuasion like talk about movies. I, I a lot of nerddom, a lot of the uh, analysis fan people that we emerge from like comics and manga and TV shows and books and giant long dense shit and i feel like a lot of our 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 types when we dip our toes into movies we're like hold on i can't like from heart write up like two pages of character bios about their emotions and arcs what's going on here this isn't what i'm used to but then when you actually like hear from movie movie buffs people who are all about movies they don't talk in the same terms of like uh, like, how can I describe every character for a fucking hour? It's usually, like, about talking about the random themes, miscellaneous, uh, not random themes, excuse me. They're usually talking about themes or just pacing or or more like the kayfabe of the movie rather than how long can you spend fanfictioning the lore, you know what I mean? I don't give a shit about lore or, ha- again, having, like, detailed art, because like I said I don't care about that. I just want, like, the, it, just the base, like, you know, flat personalities of these people to be interesting, for them to feel, like, dynamic and, like, feel like they have, like, a place in the world and that they are interesting to just have them spew generic shit. If the generic shit just interests me, uh, then I'm fine with it. I I think I do agree with the I the, the 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 thought that the movie itself is kind of bad, even though I really like it because the last time like when I was booting this up to to watch it, uh, I I got the imagery immediately. I saw the the spores and the mushrooms and the ohm and I, and the glider and I was like yes, I remember these things. Oh, I love it. Oh, I want to see it again. Um, but the story, it. Like, it was never really the draw for me. It, it feels like uh, this is, as as an experience, it's like watching a really long Sakugo gif, the whole movie. It's just like, I really like seeing these ohms move. I really like seeing all of these backgrounds and the clouds and, and everything. Yeah, the animated backgrounds, you probably had recognized some of them from, uh, yeah. from the... What the fuck was it called? The decompression chamber. Where yeah, like, that yes. was like I did, every I did. fucking thing in this movie. Um, yeah, I, I think that the problem is basically that with a lot of elements of this movie, they were there, but they never got to the point. And it, just because the movie just ends. And the only characters who I feel like they really justified in the context of this movie were Nasca and Yupa. Lord Yupa is sort of like. 
just meant to be like he's basically Gandalf. Like he basically just is Gandalf, except that he fucking has a sword instead of a staff, you know. Um, but super knows everybody in the world has been everywhere, knows everything that's going on, has the most level headed perspective. And like, you understand that about him immediately. And if you watch the dub, he's voiced by Patrick Stewart because they, they basically wanted you to know that his place is to be Picard in this story. Like, but this is a story where Picard is not the main character. Um, he's just kind of on the sidelines, but what, you know, did did everyone watch the dub here? I I watched the sub. I've seen both uh, in recently. They're equivalent. The, in Miyazaki movies, the voice acting is never really a draw for, in for, either the English or Japanese version. For me, it's it's like I don't want to have things obfuscating the nice things to look at, right. so I always choose the dub. And if it Ghibli. doesn't really matter that much, because a like the Japanese audio is never anything to write home about, and the English audio is always like major actors. If it's a Disney, you know, dub of a Miyazaki movie, so like. Either way, you're getting pretty much the same experience. Again, I feel like an asshole, but going back to what everyone's saying about how, like, you know, uh, oh, it's just one big Sakuga gift, and, and how did you, how you used gifts from the from the movie in your podcast, I just thought yeah. everything looked really ugly. Like, I really did not appreciate why, any wh- of how it. How and why, though? I, you didn't I, like I the hated, color palette? Yeah, yes, I think yes, this movie yeah, has that, an amazing exactly color palette. I hated the color palette. I absolutely hated the color palette. I thought it really? was. I, I thought. It, I thought it was just like super boring. And uh, I, I. You don't like those yellows? No. Like I, the the I, ohm tentacles or like the gold on Kushana's fucking thing? No. I I, I, thought, ah, I thought I thought everything the looked like watched out. This might have been because I watched it on kids anime, but everything felt super washed <laughs> I mean, out, I and none too. of it was like vivid or, or it is very washed out but it's it's, and, and I it's didn't a like the biopunk world you know like i thought i, I see it as weird. i see this movie as the world is meant to be first of all it is post-apocalyptic which the movie doesn't exactly clarify it's kind of like a footnote but like the the implication is that the god warriors just like were the basically I, ultimate I final weapon flat out say yeah they do they, it's they incinerated the yeah everything. Oh, okay well then yeah, they, they destroyed the whole world, uh, and we're, like, way the fuck later, and now the Forest of Corruption is trying to reset the world again, so we're, we're basically on Apocalypse number two, for humanity at least, uh, as the world attempts to cleanse itself, but, like, you know, there's, th- that again, that's another one of the things where it's an element that's in the movie, but you don't have time to have the apocalypse fully encroach, you know, the way that it would across seven volumes of, like, an epic fantasy story. Like, there's just a lot of things that are cool ideas, but then the emotional catharsis of it never gets felt, because... Again, it's just it's just kind of over before it's really begun, before, like, a lot of the points have been made. But I do think that, at the very least, Nasca like, the idea of how she's sort of a martyr and, like, if other people were able to adopt her mentality, then this would mean that people could be peaceful is, like, pretty easy to understand, I think. You know, so, like... There are elements of it that that are delivered on, and the movie does have its own conclusion. Yeah, I don't want every movie to be the complete package with all the characters that I go away from the movie loving and wanting to be with forever and uh, the great narrative payoff that makes me hyped. You know, sometimes something like, uh, hey, here's a, a little tiny bit of a story about a biopunk future with some fucking Jesus themes in it and shit, you know? I I my favorite character is is the baby Ohm who's bleeding to death. I like him and, too. And, and I think the baby Metroid when, is literally based on that. The yeah. Metroid, and Super no, Metroid. Nausicaa, baby. Nausicaa, when she she the acid gets into a fucking wound and she screams and the baby's like, Oh wait, hang on, something's going on here. And yeah. he pulls back. The fact that he actually like reacted uh uh makes me love all the bugs a lot. Yeah. Like he actually, Miyazaki's a big bug man. They're, they're, they're smart boys. I would say I got more invested as the movie went on. There were uh, two scenes that I had a pulse during, uh, and both of them were when shit was getting fucked up. Uh, I really liked the scene when I, I don't remember any of the names of literally anything. Nausicaa and the boy get on the glider, and they go to 
the place that's in the desert that's fucked up by bugs and it is like the boy's hometown i believe then he meets his friends and they uh, and they tell nausicaa that her people are fucked and she's yes a, this she's i have this gay. written down as one of my favorite scenes because i really love the way that we see her with everyone surrounding her like mm-hmm. framing her mm-hmm. and like at first it's supposed to be like jubilant like they found people and yeah. then you gradually realize that no one's on her side and now you feel trapped and claustrophobic yeah. and then everyone yeah. like runs into the frame and grabs her and like, yeah it's great you know uh she's I, never alone in the frame again i didn't that. feel like like i cared about any of the characters ex- besides scenes like that uh, and and the one where she gets uh you know her fur gets uh, put in acid those scenes i i care because not Na- nausicaa's in pain uh but i don't really like for the rest of the movie i don't really feel like anyone's in pain even though there's like death and destruction and stuff i don't really feel it on any of the characters because i don't know anything about them and i don't really care i don't even like really care about nasca but she is the main character and this movie is great so it uh is great is what i'm trying to say <laughs> you don't have to say it's great if you don't like anything i I'm not saying that purely out of, like, peer pressure. I'm not saying that because I want to fit in with the guys and kick back in a cold one. I just, I, I, there's no value in me saying these things. Because I'm not an anime guy. I'm not a film critic. I don't know what I'm doing here. I didn't want to be on. Digi said to come on, and now I'm here. So it's, (laughs) hey, everyone, it's fucking Munchie J. Trump, huh? Japanese juggalo, am I right, fellas? Teehee. Yeah. So, I just feel like when I the first time I saw this movie, I only saw the first half of it in the in a Japanese class. And I just remember being like like I never forgot the imagery, but did not remember anything about the plot. And like I really don't think I would ha- like even now had I not read the manga. Like I really think this movie stands more on like I I think the move the scene that best represents why this movie deserves to exist and I'm happy for it is the part where they're on the glider and they're being chased by a gigantic fucking serpent worm thing with like a pincer mouth and it's yeah. playing like this awesome fucking retro ass 80s synth the, the, music. The synth was sick as hell. I will not lie. Yeah. yeah. And like that scene is just an animation showcase of like this super long worm and when we were watching it last night to prep for this podcast I was high as fuck and the length of the worm just felt insurmountable. It felt like it was tugging my brain like a like a piece of gum being stretched like rubber but also has the properties of gum basically (laughs) like that's that's yeah that's how it felt watching that and like moments like that make me go oh thank god they made a movie so like i know what the colors are of the because manga is in black and white you know and yeah we know that the we get to see the ohms eyes glowing red and we get to see nasuka in the blue outfit in the golden field and it's like now when you read the manga you know what that's supposed to look like you know i but it's it's really interesting to hear you say that you saw this so long ago and like the imagery just stuck with you and that you don't remember the plot at all uh i can kind of recount the plot but like i don't remember any individual element uh, like visually, I mean, I don't, re- I don't like really remember in depth any just, of of the, the, the set okay. pieces. Okay, <sighs> I, I won't even say that I remembered the whole <laughs> I'm thing. I'm sorry. Was, okay, I'm it was sorry. Mostly, but it was mostly just the fact that, uh, and tell me if you thought this was cool, because this is the one thing that had stuck with me forever, and like is still my favorite thing about Nasca, is when they go into the forest of corruption in that scene I was just talking about, and like. The worm, like, knocks them down, and they fall through the forest into a second forest underneath the forest. Yeah. And they're like, oh, this is the purification forest where, like, the world is being reborn. And, like, the idea of the world underneath the world is, like, the coolest thing in the world to me. I totally... Okay, first of all, Kirby 64 totally did it. The same aesthetic. Hmm. You know what, what you I'm mean? talking about? No, I don't. I think, oh, the I think part I where it. you yeah. go down through the sand and you're in that little <laughs> underground world, oh, isn't that totally just like the like forest of sand in Nazca? I, 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 is. That's I funny know, just because oh, it doesn't feel the saying. same, yeah, but, I, yeah, but that, it is that, the same I, stuff. It was so hard for me to remember what level you're talking about because it just does not give you the same emotion whatsoever. It just like is you go down. I remember as a kid thinking, like, when I saw the movie, I thought, like, oh, that's, like, that scene from Kirby 64. <laughs> um, I mean, for me, it's Ash Lake from Dark Souls. Right? That's yeah, well, that's a, what like, I was going to bring obvious. up next, is that Ash Lake is oh, obviously based on it. Oh, shit. Why, yeah. why didn't I? 
Fuck. Yeah, Ash Lake is definitely based on it. I, but, I um, feel like there's too much detail sometimes in the sets. Where, like, everything's really meticulously designed, but, like, I, I just that. don't enjoy looking at it. I'm like, like, really glad you brought that yeah, up. It's that, it's that 80s high-detail fantasy world. I love, yeah, I that's love what I down here. high-detailed watercolor backgrounds that are kind of washed out. It's, 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 it reminds me of good shit. She it reminds me of good shit, shit and I like it. I, when I when the movie was starting and there's like all these pans over just like ludicrously lusciously painted backgrounds, I thought of the Dark Crystal and which is like I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it's a puppet I know movie. It. Yeah. Um that is basically just a very generic fantasy movie that I absolutely hate, but like the it's mostly known for the like super detailed puppetry and world and like that's kind of what the eighties fantasy aesthetic was even the lord of the rings movie from back then i don't know if that was in the 70s or 80s but like, 70s yeah it, it was kind of like that that's just what i think 80s worlds were more like because like fantasy was such a saturated genre at the time but it was so popular that like everyone was just trying to make up their own like unique aesthetic of a fantasy world it's like oh this one's gonna be all fucking plants this one's gonna be all this or that but like, like even Nazca the, did yeah even the fucking covers of the of those 80s movies it was like i can out airbrush you motherfucker yeah i i think much in the same way that like alien totally defined like what's you know sci-fi thrillers were gonna look like for from then on and then like you know uh blade runner defined what cyberpunk was, was gonna look like Nazca, i think did such a good job of this like biopunk bugs aesthetic that it defined that forever but unfortunately whereas those other movies like inspired anime and video games to make like a billion iterations of them with Nasca because it's already an anime like no one wanted to compete with it i think that's the th that's the problem with everything that's like the problem with miyazaki everything he did was so perfect no one can follow him because when you try you end up with something like children who chase lost voices which is just a shit pile or that his own looks son like vaguely like a Miyazaki movie or yeah Goro who can't who can't top it but like it's a shame because the specific aesthetic of this movie should be plumbed to death yeah. like i do think super metroid took a lot of influence from it um the mushi hime sama games are known for you know, yeah, and I don't even think that, this is an aesthetic that Ghibli could do now, or at least it's not anything like what no. they do now. Now it's much more clean. It's all no one could do this aesthetic now, and it's it's a shame because, uh, man, my my friend Ghost Lightning used to have on his like wish list of like a, his anime wish list a a seven part OVA adaptation of the Nasca manga would be like Shit. the ultimate anime because the ma the manga really is an epic like it has a lot of big messages to say it's like a religious epic it what you you had written in your notes that this movie doesn't quite go all the way with the Christ allegory with Nasca the manga goes way past all the way like she literally lives the entire story of I Christ may have written it wrong but you're you're reading the note backwards actually oh actually what does it say well hold on so uh, well, hold it on. Says she doesn't just go capital J Jesus at the end. A so, biblical paradigm of good and evil. Are you saying she goes even higher? Oh, okay, than okay, J hold Jesus. on, hold on. So, I, okay, I'm, I've been kind of like sitting on a whole themes grenade on this whole time, and I don't want to like go into go it until it. we're like ready. Okay, so here's the thing. Uh, the, I guess the thing that was the, the emotional investment keeping me through the whole thing very excitedly was thinking about the environmentalist message and the mindset of people who do that shit, you know, like Miyazaki, who's feels like every movie he makes is environmentalist in some way or another. It's about the environment. You know, it's a it's a classic fucking anime manga thing, you know? Uh Tezuka did it a lot too. And I I think that the way that uh Nausicaa presents her is presented in this story as basically the eco ubermensch, the environmentalist Jesus, right? She's the one who can speak for the trees, or in this case, the Metroid bugs. And she's able to sort of bridge the gap between the misunderstandings between the humans and nature. And with her wisdom, we shall live in peace and harmony. And it made me think, I think the reason why this sort of, I feel like it's like the most direct and blatant wish fulfillment fantasy of normal people here in the real world regarding uh, the environment. And a lot of environmentalist shit sort of presents it this way. You know, actual the actual concerns regarding the environment is, is a whole lot of, like, math 
and resource management and business and politics. But the way it plays out in a lot of people's hearts is much more biblical, I think. We think of it as, you know, uh, uh, oil and coal and our resources. Our, our society doesn't pollute the earth because of carbon atoms or whatever the fuck atoms and, and like uh, chemistry and shit. No, human society pollutes the earth as the ultimate ironic punishment for the sins of being. Like it, it's the self-hatred of ourselves and, and what we represent that we can then extend to actual chemistry, actual science that backs up that worldview. And I think that environmentalism might be the world's fastest growing religion and that's what I'm going to call it, but a very atheistic one. Uh, and it's, as religions go, probably a huge improvement because it's, it, it insists on being based in science and on being based on empirical evidence, but it leaves it with many challenges. So I do think environmentalism has a lot going for it, right? Uh, regarding sort of filling in that gap that people used to put, more people used to put God or Allah into, right? Um, but now a lot of people are like switching to the eco alternative because it sort of has this big apocalypse narrative going on with climate change or just in general, even if without climate change, just the amount of pollution could eventually hit a tipping point Wally style. Especially for someone like Miyazaki, who's always been involved in like local river cleanup and oh, stuff like oh, that. Really? Like, yeah, he's, he's very involved in like local cleaning efforts. So Sweet. he has literally watched like neighborhoods he grew up in, like go to shit. Like Whoa. the whole river God in, uh, in spirited away. Like the right. idea did, that did Miyazaki live that scene where they were pulling the, the shitty yeah, gunk out of the face. That literally is based off of a real thing he did where he pulled a bicycle out of a lake. That's cool. I didn't know Miyazaki did like real shit. I, I need to do yeah, some research. Yeah, he's a hands on the ground guy. So yeah, like. That, that's the Watch thing. Watch Kingdom of Dreams and Madness. He's like a, he's the kind of guy who does, like, Ghibli does radio calisthenics every morning. Like, that's the kind of studio they are. So, um, that, that's exactly what it is. It's one of those things, just like how uh, the Christian Bible presents this ultimate fate for the world, but you can have a sense of purpose by, by edging it along. Like, you can actually make the world just a little bit better by spreading the word of God and, and spreading goodwill towards men. And you can also make it worse by spreading hate and evil and uh, demonic shit. So, <clears throat> or like, I guess playing Pokemon. So, similarly, even though the environment's ultimately going to come down to politics and industry, you can give yourself a sense of satisfaction by just sorting through your fucking trash and throwing some of it into the recycling bin, you know, or like getting a, a slow, a lower gas mileage car, right? People sort of do this as a little, little trinkets, little tributes to the environmental god, in a sense, right? To sort of absolve them of the sins that they see their broader society as being, being guilty of. So the, the issue, of course, is that not everything about religiosity can be trans transferred into this environmental setup because ultimately you're still going to be bumping up against um even no matter how eco-friendly you can make shit you're still going to bump up against uh uh entropy right like that's the whole reason why i don't get like full on the environmentalist bandwagon in a way is because i don't really see it as being in the long long term ultimately the solution when entropy is going to like cancel it all out anyway and and also environmentalism lacks a god. There is no one who can just come in and solve it willy-nilly, right? And that's what Nausicaa presents herself as. And, and I do think it's like the way that, at least the way the movie presents the lore, I think is a little bit, it was, I thought it was a little bit silly, at least the way the movie presents the lore, and a little bit contrived to present this scenario where a great redeemer can come in and make everything right. Because it's like, if the Ohms are so fucking smart, why, and if they want to, if what they want to do is to cleanse the world, why the fuck do they have such a crazy uh, foreign policy? Like, oh shit, you fucked with us slightly or moderately, we will destroy you completely now. They never like come up and be self-sacrificing like Nausicaa would be. They never come out and be like, fine, keep hitting me. Here, here's my little communication tentacles. 
Here, I'm just going to sit here, wait for someone curious enough to listen to my communication tentacles, and I'll tell you all about what we're fucking doing with the soil and the toxins and the purification. No, the ohms never fucking do that, even though they're supposed to represent what's good in this world. They, for some reason, have the craziest I mean, plan I, ever. I don't think humans can understand their communication so I guess only Nausicaa can? Nausicaa. Like, she's just a fucking biopunk new type? She's Fluttershy. She knows yeah. she's Fluttershy. She gets animals. Well, here's here's the way I think Nausicaa's meant to sort of be interpreted. And in the manga, they really push the idea of her as, like, a Christ allegory that she is, like, literally, like, like she's different from... Like, she's a... Uh, what's the word? What do they call it? Messiah. Well, dude, they, okay, they, hold, they on, present hold on, hold on. Spoiler for the movie, the last scene is her being risen from the dead and then walking sort of, like, on tentacles... Sort of like walking on water. And there's literally a prophecy. Like, the old woman, the old, like, religious woman is like, hey, this is the prophecy fulfilled. Like, she is the fucking, the second coming of, like, whatever. They show, like, some god that that is, like, the god of the grain, I guess, of these people. And she is sort of the human embodiment of it. Just like the Jesus. And uh, that really becomes, like, central to the story going forward in the manga. To the point that, like, she, like, basically lives the entire Bible, you know. Um... But like, yes. Uh no, I was just I was just gonna say I wish I could I wish I could like enjoy fantasy stuff without knowing that themes exist and that people <laughs> use them. <laughs> yeah, that's because when all I because like when I first watched this, it was just like you know the prophecy and all the environment stuff. It's just it just it was just yes, that is the story that is being told. Uh, this is real. And uh, these are the characters, and this is the thing that happens. I mean, but then, I, I think and then, Kizaki and now wants I know to themes... preserve your ability to watch the movie that way, though. Like, I think the reason that the movie doesn't, like, beat you over the head with the themes... There's, there's a few scenes where, like, old, very old characters will just kind of preach at the camera for a second, like... You know, oh, uh, this is uh, why you should have love in your heart, because Nasca did this, and that's why, uh, if you guys just thought about it for a second, like, this is what the world is like, but th there's only a couple moments like that. For the most part, I think he wanted them to be, you know, this is, like, what's informing the story, but the story is itself. It is a story that you can... You know, you can just get involved in this world. The things are not happening just for the sake of telling this message. Right. Well, for me, I think what, what plunged me out of, like, plot thought and into theme thought was when I thought, okay, is Nausicaa the only one who figured out the toxins are in the soil? Are she and that guy the only one who fell through the fucking other world sand pit? Like, no one else has gotten the word out? Like, we still have enough industry and science to keep building planes, but no one is still... That's kind of the, one of the biggest things that's, like, the biggest liberty taken with human nature in, like, 95% of fiction is curiosity. I think, well, I think this disconnect happens also because of the fact of how this movie opens. And it opens in a really interesting way because it's trying to guide the viewer's perspective on this from the perspective of Nasca, who is, like, not a normal person in this world. Um, so at the beginning of the movie, like, Nasca's in the forest and she's, like, openly exploring it. She's curious about it. She thinks it's beautiful, but she's also telling us, like, it's dangerous and nobody goes here. And I think because of the fact that, like... She understands the insects. She knows how to, like, not cause a fuss. She understands how to, like, make Teto calm down, how to make the Ohm calm down. Like, immediately we're sympathetic to all these elements. Like, the movie Im tells us right off the bat, like, the bugs have minds. Like, you can reason with them. The forest has, like, it is beautiful. We don't need to burn it down, you know? But, like, this is a super outsider perspective in the context of the story to the point that Lord Yupa, who's like the most open-minded guy, the most like well-lived and well-learned, when he sees the cultivation that Nasca's doing down in the basement, he's like shook. He's like, what the fuck? You've been growing plants down here? Like, no one's ever tried this before, you know? And it's because like she just literally has been in a position where she can explore these forests more than anybody else can because she's just re like she's she's always been for some reason sympathetic towards these animals and we, you know we eventually see flashbacks of her like being othered by the entire society around her where like everyone wants to take this little baby insect and kill it from her and like she really feels like a powerless 
like outsider to the gr- group here because she's like you're gonna do this thing that would hurt me very deeply if you killed this yeah, insect. Yeah, I'm, and, I'm and, like you know. role playing now the idea of a studio exec pretending that I was just sent the script for this and maybe some storyboards and Munchie is the the test audience I played it, it to and I if my first note if I wanted to mainstream it up a bit to give it a little bit more uh, a little bit more typical punch I would say okay make a new character maybe like a guy right um who's like sort of the other main character and he's just like a more normal person and maybe it's like 20 to 25 minutes before nasuka like really shows up maybe she has some scenes to herself but like she's off doing some other thing so then like 30 minutes the first 30 minutes is just spent showing you the actual status quo of the society making all the plant shit as as scary as possible and then nasuka shows up and they have a whole new world moment where like they go into the thing and he's like, "What? Well, this is so dangerous. She's like, oh, just have a mask on. Don't worry. Have a mask on. You'll die slowly. What? <laughs> oh, whimsy, right? And then the audience would be like, oh, I'm supposed to be scared, but I'm, now I'm not scared. That was an arc. Yeah, I think Nasuka, funnily enough, is meant... If you were to read the whole manga, you would not get the sense it was made for kids. You would not get the sense it was like meant to be family-friendly. It feels much more like a serious war story. Lots of characters die, you know? Like, that was something that was... Uh, I mean, you know, it's common. It's in lots of fucking action shows, but no one... like ve- People very rarely like die on screen, you know? And like yeah, things, I mean, we just it, hadn't gotten that far yet. Yeah, I, I mean, mean, a lot like, of the characters oh, in this movie would have died yeah. later in the manga. It, you if know? you're someone who won't watch an action thing, if people like constantly survive like hails of bullets, this is going to be a problem. There's, it even goes a step beyond that, where like, oh man, this giant metal steel structure is breaking apart right above this giant crowd of people. Good thing only small and slightly medium small pieces of steel are falling on us. Huh? Good. Now we can just brush them all off. Whew. That was weird. Even though there is, like, scary-looking scenes in the movie of, like... Uh, I really love the way that Miyazaki... fights. Yeah. Yeah, the way he portrays war is always very realistic and very, like, um, detailed. And I fucking love his skirmishes. There, in a lot of his movies, you'll just get, like, a three- or four-second-long cut of, like, guys in a field just swinging swords at each other, like, flamethrowers and shit. Yeah. And, uh... There's one of those in this, and just, like, lots of shots of dudes firing, like, very technical-looking machinery and stuff, and, like, all that feels very cool and real, and I I think this movie, uh, and and generally all Ghibli movies, this is something that's unique about them, and maybe it's just a very Japanese way of filmmaking, but... Um, they all have like more of a historical approach yeah. to scenes as opposed to dramatic. It's a little like, bit more documentary just, style. Yeah, they don't focus on just the most important parts. They tell you every step of the battle. Like, right, very clinical. The characters have to move from all the way from point A to point E, and we have to see them at every step of the way. And as a result, like every scene is very long. Yeah, scenes are long and also kind of stoic. That's another thing. Like characters, are, I mean, Miyazaki's level is like. Well, everyone dead. Everyone's dead. Okay, let's go. Whereas, you know, with the Tomino style is literally everyone in the universe is dead now. All right, moving on. So, yeah. you know, it's not the most extreme, but... Yeah, but it's it's just that, like, there's certain battle scenes in this movie where even though all of the fighting looks amazing, I felt like we don't need to see any of these guys. Like, none of these characters who we're watching fight are important. The only reason that we're watching these scenes is so that we understand the exact scale of the battle, the nature of the weapons being used. Like, we have a full perspective on exactly what this battle was. Yes, yeah, so you can really feel the difference in military power. Us fucking 21st century Americans, we don't really, like, think about, like, oh, yeah, that's a concern. It for every other country, whether or not your military is big enough. Uh, which you wrote, you wrote a note saying, like, is this sort of like similar to the Ottomans versus the Persians and something like that? Yeah. Well, okay. So I, I believe this story is set in the uh, the Middle East. Um, it's so so sort of because when you look at the like outfits and everything of the the Valley of the Wind characters, like they're kind of not really Middle Eastern, but that, like, somewhere in the area between, like, the Middle East and Asia, you know, is kind of the feeling I get. And in the manga, there's, like, maps and shit of the world, and it looks like it is set there. But, like, um, and then the, the, the like, Muslim allegory characters are from, like, they live in, like, a desert place, which on the map in 
the manga looks like it could be Saudi Arabia or something. So I'm thinking it takes place in that, that kind of area and might be sort of a metaphor for some kind of historical conflict in that area since there is like the religious element. It's there's kind of like a metaphor for the Crusades in the manga. Well, but the war it metaphor I felt movie. was a lot closer to home because once I started seeing those giant fucking fuck off planes, I felt like the Valley of the Wind is World War II era Japan and the uh, whatever their fucking names were. I just watched the movie for the first time, so I, I can't remember all the names yet. Is fucking Germany World War II era, right? Which I think that was probably pretty intentional considering that Miyazaki then did actual World War II era Japan feeling like they got outdicked by German because like in The Wind Rises, you know, the character is spending the whole movie building these tiny little rinky dink wooden planes. And it's like, oh, we will now show you the German plane. And it's just like this giant behemoth of steel. And I feel like maybe younger Miyazaki was presenting that more allegorically and more like just raw emotionally and then just drew the planes as these giant lumbering. How the fuck is that not falling apart? That's the might of these crazy industrial civilizations that your poor little 1950s J Japanese ass couldn't even conceive of in your poor ass little country. As I, I feel like the the kind of feeling that Miyazaki is exuding with the, the the role that the Valley of the Wind portrays, just being kicked around by all the other big. You figures. know, I think a lot of that is just the strength of the sense of iconography of the movie. That like the empire, like you have a very clear sense of the different styles of like planes and technology technology that different countries have like the valley of the wind has this weird little thing that nasca rides that seems to weigh like 15 pounds because the kid just the one guy just carries it over his head yeah well here's point. the thing with like, that right i think i mean i could be completely destroyed on this because the manga might explain it but i kind of think that maybe like there's atmospheric differences in this setting like i don't know how humans are able to breathe but like okay because you know back in the day we used to have pretty big bugs and they died because the atmosphere changed, and that's why humans exist now. And if you know that, that's why Jurassic Park couldn't work, even if you got the DNA, is because the atmosphere is different. So I'm thinking that like the eco disaster that took place a thousand years ago changed like the air pressure, and that's why you know you, you can you've sort of gotten 25 percent of the way there. So 75 percent of the rest of the explanation could just be a hand wave as to why giant stupidly designed planes like that are able to fly right because in real in the real world you can't even get anything like even a hundred times that lumpy uh to actually take off and so i'm thinking that's also why her tiny little glider can like work so well and maybe also why they can do those crazy 15 foot in the air jump sometimes it doesn't it really doesn't quite hold up because i don't know how people can ever breathe without a mask in that case but if so i do think that's pretty genius like world building hand waves to excuse the cool fantasy airships that every fantasy artist wants to do all the time i figured out if i can shift gears here a little bit why i don't like the aesthetic that much is because the world looks like the world of avatar it looks like pandora Looks like mm. I, I kind of agree. I think Pandora was probably partly inspired by Nazca. Oh, yeah, actually, no, I was actually thinking while watching it, James Cameron should cancel all four Avatars or just um, all four Avatar sequels or just slightly recast it and retool some things and then do just the Nausicaa movie in live action. I would action. rather have – okay, would you rather have James Cameron – because I was actually going to discuss this. If there was a live action Nausicaa because I think it could work as no, a live action uh, movie. James Cameron or nobody. Or maybe, oh, uh, fucking, oh, what's Peter Jackson. Peter Jackson, Guillermo del Toro would do a good job on the monster. Just get all three Guillermo of them. Guillermo del Toro, holy fuck. Yeah, yeah get him to fucking him. do the ohms. And then get fucking Peter Jack. Yeah, just get all of them. Just just have all the good at <laughs> directors directed all at once. To go back to what I'm saying, the <laughs> scenes are so detailed and, like, you know, like, intensely designed that it's hard to parse sometimes. And I just feel like I'm looking at a bunch of lines. And it's... and it's. Bunch of lines. I'm going to sound like a real asshole, but it feels <laughs> kind of a, a, obnoxious. And it feels like, look at how beautiful this scene is. But, like, it's hard get it. for me to even, like, see what's beautiful that's, that's about it. That's kind of how the 80s were, in a way. Like, everything yeah. was very audacious to the point that... there's a, There are moments when I'm watching 80s anime where I'll see an image that's so detailed and is on screen for so little time that I just come away thinking, why did you spend so long drawing that and only let me look at it for three fucking seconds? There wasn't seconds. any fucking like, Twitter yet. No artist had anything else to do with their time. I, I kind of get it, but, like, were you not watching it in full screen? No, I was. <laughs> okay. I, I, I just was not 
it's a combination of like it's not that I literally could not parse it. It's just that it was a combination of the compression not being very good on Kiss Anime, and also me not caring about the basic block features of it, like the basic like colors and just way that it generally looks. I thought it looked like Pandora that I wasn't interested enough to pause it. I do think if I was if I had watched it on anything less than the twelve point seven gigabyte file that I watched it on, like yeah, the Jesus the de- fuck. If the details suffered at all, I I would definitely feel the hit, you know. So I feel like it's one of those movies that kind of improves with age as the viewing technology gets better. I kind of like when better. I watch like something that's super detailed, but I can't see all the details, and it just makes it feel real to me. Like ah uh, yeah, like that that VHS feeling, kind of like I don't know if any of you saw the H Bomber guy video where he talked about how like horror movies, like low budget horror movies, really took off in the VHS era because like just the shittiness of the picture made things scarier. Of course, yeah. It makes things seem realer, yeah. Yeah, and I think that I think that's part of why a lot of those '80s movies were so uh, like ridiculous, like that. Because you got to remember, these would have been played on CRTs, which right? Is like unlimited cathode rays blasting. Th- Not that this movie would have been first played that way; it would have been first played in a the theater, but it would have been like very bright and huge and in your face in the theater, and then at home, beloved on like these other TVs. So I, I think that watching it on a computer screen might be one of the worst ways that this movie could probably be enjoyed. You know, I, I'm on Google Image Search. I typed in Nausicaa backgrounds and even still seeing them in much better quality than I originally saw them they aren't doing anything for me well can't win every Guys, everyone you know remember that guy who, who pops his head up and he says yeah, do we have any orders <laughs> and the guy says shut up and he yes. says yes sir I yes. love that that is great that was actually that was I, the I, one I joke deny. Yeah, and it was very funny yeah that actually, that line made me like rewind and then like switch to Japanese audio just because I wanted to hear what that guy sounds like in Japanese. I do think the dub, the, the uh, English voice is better. He's like really slimy and uh, just nonchalant. That character not of uh, that like bad guy character was so smarmy and like yeah. um, nonplussed about everything that was happening. But I, that, I really, that's really like the, the whole. Okay, Digi, what's the fucking giant metal planes people? What's their kingdom called? Oh, Shinji. Fuck. Uh, Tormekia? Tormekia, whatever. The thing about them that was cool that made... Okay, if, if this weren't the case, the preachiness would have like been taken up a couple notches. The Tormekia, or whatever the fuck they're called, are like super just cynical and... They're kind of like really level-headed. The other, the other tribe, the other fucking kingdom. They're the more idealistic ones, and they come in at the last minute. They're all the self-righteous ones, right? But like the Tormekia are all just like, yeah, we know we're stomping around. Hey, man, it's post-apocalyptia, bro. Survival of the fittest, dog. You know, and they're yeah, represented by their leaders. They just don't give that. a fuck. Because we learn way more about them in the manga, and Kusharna kind of comes from basically literally Game of Thrones. Like, she has, like, five brothers and sisters, and she's, like, one of the younger ones, and they all have been trying to kill each other for, like, the throne basically forever. So, like, they, they like she the reason she has all those, like, fucked up injuries on her body uh, that she's she mentions... Jamie Lannister. She's got the she's basically, gold, yeah, hand. She's basically a Lannister. Um... In fact, she's a lot like Cersei in general, but, like, without the, uh, you know, without the age. But, like, she's got that same kind of angry bite. And much like Cersei in the manga, you do eventually get to see her, like, lead major battles and stuff. Game of Thrones as a manga? (laughs) Yeah. There actually is a Game of Thrones manga. Uh, I have no idea if it's any good, but there's a very famous page of Gregor Clegane, like, full page saying, fuck the king. Um, Anyway... She comes from the Game of Thrones universe, so, like, where they are, it's it's very much meant to be, like, the ultimate capitalist society, kind of like the everyone gets everything by their bootstraps, like, idealistic, and then the other one is, like, the highly religious, everyone, like, for, forms as a wave, and that's why those people understand the Omu a lot more, because the Omu are collectivist as a bug species with a literal hive mind, you know, so, like, that's why they're sort of more in tune with the Earth, whereas the individualistic people, again, more explored in the manga, but it's it's lightly touched on in the movie. And I really do like how, I kind of feel like everything you need to know about Nazca is pretty much set in stone when she has the confrontation on the little on the on the boat planes in the fucking forest with uh wait what was her name uh the lannister in nasca gold girl the gold girl uh, yeah Kish- because Kisharna. gold girl is just so fucking she's she's supposed to be the hard head 
cool headed like one who can out scene everyone else but then nasuka just like out scenes her by like pure jesus of the story power you know and because what's cool about nasuka because you know she's full tilt like super idealistic strong female protagonist character so it's like oh but she a mary sue and as uh tom explained in one of his old 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 videos from like 2013 being a Mary Sue kind of has more to do with whether or not the character is challenged than it has to do with whether or not the character is like a morally almost perfect person, right? And so Nasuka, you know, just from the first scene, it's like, okay, so she's like pretty and smart and strong and tough and brave and like all the animals love her and all the people love her. Okay, well, what's, go what's gonna happen next? Oh shit, she like tries and fails to save people like three scenes in a row, then loses her shit and kills people. And now she's like really afraid of herself, right? So My when she fight, uh, what? what's up well i was just gonna say my fa one of my favorite things about it was like most of the time things get worse before they get better yeah. when it comes to her doing things even like even right at the beginning when she's like uh trying to calm down the little uh cute fox squirrel thing yeah. it it before before she befriends it like magically um it bites her and she right. gets hurt so right. it's like that's like what happens. Well, okay, I gotta get into that because that is what I think is the core of Nasca's character is that moment, which right. is that Nasca unflinchingly puts everyone else before herself, and she doesn't even consider the idea of trying to get even, and that's basically the difference between her and everyone else. Including is that the like, ohms. right? Including the ohms. It, everyone else feels this need for vengeance, this need to sort of right. like set the stage and be fair, and Nasuka doesn't feel that way, and there's, not only does she have, like, she lets Teto bite her because she knows that, like, as long as he gets it out of his system, he'll calm down and we'll be friends, and she's just willing to sacrifice that bit of pain to make that happen, because she right. knows that it's the best way to resolve the conflict. Yeah. So, you know, later on, she rescues Kusharna without question, doesn't matter that she just killed her father. Right. She rescues her from the burning building. She holds her own life hostage to the villagers, which is probably my favorite scene in the movie is when, like, the the guys are being stubborn and she's, like, telling them to right. take the luggage off their plane. And then she just pulls off the mask and is like, they're like, You're, you'll die if you don't put on the mask. She's like, drop the fucking luggage. You know, it's yep. like she's literally saying, like, I will kill myself if you don't do what I say. Um, I mean, she probably knew they were immediately going to do it, but it's just... This is like her superpower, right. basically. And again, is, like it is, it is challenged. There is the scene where she flips shit, and then somehow is just yeah. able to out. Just with all of her fucking ecology knowledge, is just magically like stronger <laughs> than like stronger a guy who's like six else. five, six foot five with giant fucking armor, right? And then just like stabs shit out of four people, and then she's like, "All right, well, I've had my arc now. Now I'm like gonna be serious, you know? Now I'm not, now I'm not gonna do that shit anymore." So like her arc's basically over at that point in terms of like. It's really funny that that scene portrayed that way in the movie because I went back to read the manga because I saw that the dad died and I didn't remember that happening in volume one so I went to go see how this scene plays out in the manga and the way it is is that Kusharna and her people just kind of land off in an open field and they get out and like Nasuka's like you guys need to get the fuck out of here like we don't you know, we don't want you doing fucking around. And they just have like this big knight come out and she has like a one-on-one -on -one duel with the knight. And then Yupa stops them the same way he does in the movie. But like, there is no scene of her just like laying okay. waste to five that, or six guys. That, so that, I don't yeah. know why that got in There's there. There's a couple of like, okay, cause that was clearly consolidated awkwardly in translation moments where it's like, why is this character doing this thing? Number one victim of that is why the fuck did they just immediately kill the king of this village that they're trying to emotionally corral? Yeah. their empire what the, the fuck the the most the, the strangest thing was like they 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 smash through a windmill they they start shooting immediately they yeah. kill the king they get the tanks and then what's her face golden girl says we come in peace join us I'm like, why <laughs> yeah. yeah so the weird. manga's not like that at all it, it's it's just a problem of like uh, the reason that there was a fight at all in the manga is just that Nasuka like doesn't want them there. Like she's right. very aggressive that like they they're supposed to have a treaty that they will not be fucked with. Right. And um but like, you know, Yupa stops the fighting and then like the idea that Nasuka's kind of afraid of herself is more of a subtle character note from that point more so than I think in the movie they just thought, well, like Nasuka needs a more clear and fulfilling arc to propel right. us like to care about her through this early part of the movie so they have that happen but because it only really gets talked about the one time and there's no like resolution to that arc 
we don't really it, it, I don't think it has that much impact ultimately. Well, I, I am like of the belief that you don't have to have a character then go oh good my, my character arc is resolved for a character arc to just sort of like be resolved it's just sort of like alright not gonna keep killing anymore I don't feel like there has to be a scene where like she almost pulls the knife out dun 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 but then she puts it back in. Dun, 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 dun. I don't feel like you always need to have something like I, that. I just it's... feel like it would have been nice for her to be challenged again on that, you know? Uh, but I, I guess later in the movie, know. we do have the moment where she has the gun I, pointed I, at the guy. I fi- so. yeah, I, yeah, I just find that, like, it's often overdone. I find that, like, it's like it's kind of predictable when it's like, oh, when are they are going to be tested on it again? Like, you know, sometimes you can just drop it, you know? So here's my headcanon. Based on this, and this is only going to make sense to people who've seen Psychopaths, so I don't know if Munchie <laughs> or Hippo have any idea. But, um, so in Psychopaths, there's a concept that the society is run by people who have criminally asymptomatic brains, which means that they, when they are committing a crime, their brain does not like recognize what they're doing the same way that normal people do, and therefore the system does not detect them doing criminal activity the way that it would with other people. And so when they find a person like that, they put their brain into the system and those are the people who run the society. I think Nasco would be one of these brains because of the fact that she would happily commit crimes without thinking of them as crimes. Like she takes the, you know, she's hiding the ohm at the beginning from people. Like clearly this is not something people think is okay you know, or like when she lets the, the, the thing bite her at the start, it's like she she will put saving others before anything else. And because she knows that's right, she'll never like even if she's breaking the law to do it, it would never register with her. So I think she would be criminally asymptomatic and her brain would be in the jars, which makes sense because she's basically an archetype for a moral. So I think that's pretty much what those brains are meant to be, you know, true. Since that's what Makishima is. It's, it's just interesting an that, like, for her, a, uh, you, you know, th- talking about the little cute mascot character animal thing that bites the shit out of her finger. I was, I really, like, it ended up being one of the mascot characters or, like, sidekick pets that I really liked at first. Um, because usually they're just really slapped in there just so that you can feel like someone else may die if main character doesn't get out of this perilous situation, but they often don't add much. Uh, like the one in fucking oh the one in fucking uh, boy and the beast. Pokemon. The, the one in fucking be- boy and the beast is literally just a little like circle blob with eyes that does literally nothing and almost never even shows up. It's so fucking lazy. But at first I really liked this this little raccoon piece of shit because you actually like watch the main character earn the right to have the mascot it doesn't just show up and love them for no reason you know but after that it doesn't really do anything other than uh initiate the one fan service moment in the whole fucking movie which i thought was pretty good i would say it was i I, it inserts itself into the movie in a moment where like when she's about to leave like to go on her journey it just kind of jumps on her shoulder just like i'm the mascot like we're doing this like i'm with you for the rest of the movie now you i know? thought the the ma- like his name is teto i think uh, yes. i thought he was absolutely disgusting i hated him <laughs> i don't love he him he was vile he, he he was he was vile i just and wish he had, he had an art his, his, his colors made me like physically ill his design but was dude, like a Digimon. He was it's awful. Pikachu. True. Yeah, you know, you, you know I, what? You're right. I He's do great. think I do think Teto exists primarily to draw young girls into this movie. He's not even like, cute. He's not cute. He looks like Vulpix or something. Like girls He's just shit. like feral, small, fluffy cat-like animals. He looks animals, like a warrior regardless cat. Of what they, the people like that. Yeah, but like, dude, that's so, what young girls like. So I, I think that. Because the way that he's so, like, at the beginning, you know, there's, like, a purpose to, to show this element of Nasca's development. But, like, sure. the moment he jumps on her shoulder and is just with her for the rest of the adventure for no reason, it's officially, like, this is now a Disney marketing mascot character to yeah. me, you know? He, he does absolutely nothing. And he's just there to, like, sometimes appear and make him go, ugh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What did you think? I didn't really think much of him, but I do like that... that- the meeting of her, you know, he's, when he becomes her friend, like that's okay, and that's so a, that's a good weirdly scene. Weirdly proportioned, and his like tail is so, it's it's just it's like Nyquil. It's Nyquil to my eyes. 
<laughs> anyway, it's what, dangerous. What did you think of Nasca's tits that you got to see for like half a second so that the animal mascot could like get into her shirt? I care far less about Nasca's tits than her weird bare ass just shoved my face so constantly happy. in not like sexy ways. Just like it's just there and it's just what? Stop. Dude, you know she's wearing pants, right? Those are pants she's wearing. Wait, what? You, yeah, yeah, she is wearing skin colored pants. But it's just oh! an excuse to draw her ass. Yeah. But like it it was funny. The 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 I remember watching this on TV with my dad and he was like, "Why is she naked? What's yeah. going on here?" And uh, I was like, "Uh-oh. Yeah. Uh-oh, my dad's learning if that." You're enemies, so <laughs> if you pay very close attention, her skin tone is slightly different from her pants tone, but like barely. It's a lot more evident on like the covers of the the manga. But like, because they 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 look more white, but like Miyazaki, when he talked about how he got into making anime, he he saw like the 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 very first Toei anime film Hakujaden, and he said that he would go to the theater every week and watch the movie at a time when he didn't have a girlfriend because the main girl was like a girlfriend to him, right. i.e. his waifu. Yeah. So he's a big waifu fan. And he's made lots of fucking waifus. Nasuka is. Without question, supposed to be a waifu. Like, he wanted to draw her ass and tits because she's a waifu. He just wants to get away with it. He wants to do it in a classy way where you're not yeah. going to fucking question it. And he does this by having the character... His characters, like, don't think of themselves sexually. Like, they're very right. open with their bodies. Like, if you watch all his movies, all his characters will show their underwear continually. Yeah, throughout his the movie. fucking masterpiece of fucking... Like totally classy, not fan service at all. This is just how it would actually be. Is is fucking Kiki flying around on her broom and then just like bloomers constantly, like taking up twenty percent of the fucking frame. Same goes for my neighbor Totoro. The little girl's underwear are always on screen. Ponyo, yeah. her underwear's always on screen. Because, like, and he always does it to where like no one fucking calls him out on it. Like people try to imitate it. Like, okay, you know the fucking like short film of like the girl on the fucking chair that bounces around that Funimation yeah, uses for their Poulette, logo. No, there's there's times where like her her fucking panties are showing and it like doesn't make sense why her panties are showing. Like there's one time where she's laying down and for some reason her dress is like all the way up to her belly and it's like, why did that get there? This seems perverted now. But like every Miyazaki movie, it's like, well, uh, I'm definitely gonna go to go to go Gelboro after this, but this feels classy. Uh, somehow you get away well, with it. How the, the, the fuck did he get away with it? The funny thing about it is Isao Takahata does the same thing, but with full blown tits in every movie. Like he shows yeah. little girls naked in all his movies. Just, I think the just, reason they do yeah. it is that they want the characters to be like totally unguarded, completely right. innocent, complete. Like you understand everything about them. Nothing is secret, but without it being like weird or perverted. Yeah, and also yeah, they're really respectful in their characterization and like okay even though they have like pretty ass faces and nice hair and stuff like from that one opening her jacket scene you can tell that like Nasuka has like a pretty masculine build like she's got like some like crazy ass shoulders she kind of looks like an old Michelangelo painting if you know what I mean so like it's got it, it, it just checks off so many of the feminist requirements you know what I mean and I think that makes it like very palatable I really think he was trying to design, like, what he saw as, like, the perfect woman, you know? Right. Like, like the attitude, look, and, like, you know, morality of, like, what would be the most ideal human being right. to him, which, of course, would have to be a cute girl because right. he's an anime guy. And that's right. That's what they do. But, like, I do think that, yeah, part of it is just to, to be very unguarded. And, and one of the very unique things about... Uh, Nasuka in particular, I I'd have to watch all of Miyazaki's movies to determine whether I thought he did this with, like, Japanese characters as well, or if this is because it the characters aren't Japanese, but he displays just absolutely unguarded joy from his characters. There's a scene when Nasuka meets Yupa where she just runs up and hugs him and spins around and she's fucking yeah. smiling like a reckless abandon and it's just like the happiest looking scene in the world, and... That is so non-Japanese and so non-anime. Like, I can think of so many scenes in anime where two characters who haven't seen each other in years will, like, run up to each other and then stand and talk. And, like, not right. even touch each other. You know, I'm like, even not thinking even hug about or... how it goes all the way down to, like, K 
character designs, face designs. I'm thinking about lots of, you know, lots of typical face designs, lots of more abstract ones or more off kilter ones. And usually the expressions they excel at is like crying or anger, especially, you know, in a lot of designs. But Ghibli faces really excel at like big, wide open, colon D faces over like any other kind of expression, I think. Yeah, he's a uh, he's got a knack for just displaying like I think it's just that so few other media tries to display that. Like it's almost embarrassing the way that he shows just like you know, abject joy and he especially shows it in older characters who are sort of presented as like they they don't see any need to put on airs anymore. Like if you watch Kiki for instance, like the old ladies in that movie are just so jubilant cuz like they have nothing to guard. You and know? even but then when you get the fucking Ponyo, the old ladies are like the most like fucking realistic old people I've ever seen probably cuz Miyazaki was able to then use himself as a fucking reference, you know? The way that they move, the way that their heads move, it's like, "Wow, I have definitely seen this exact 93-year-old granny at like a nursing home." Like exactly this kind of personality. I'm really surprised. No one is people. You don't even see that in live action movies. People don't like cast correctly for that shit. Yeah. I should mention, by the way, that I have seen Ponyo recently in theaters in Boston. I thought it was legitimately actually nine out of ten. Yeah. Sick. Yeah. We'll like get okay. To that eventually. So so so, so Digi. Like a lot of people say that Miyazaki's movies used to be better. Like, and they typically talk about like writing or like imagination. I guess. Are there people who say that his original movies from the 80s looked better? I'm I don't know if anyone says that. It really right. depends on who you ask, I guess. I mean, I, like I would old say that shit. like I like old shit aesthetically, so yeah, I yeah. Pr- pr- prefer like anything that's in 4x3 and anything that's <laughs> watercolor painting. I mean, this movie backgrounds. is very the the animation cells and everything look very shaky. There's a lot right. less detail, a yeah. lot less cleanliness, and that's because of the fact that it was not like a fully formed studio, basically. Like, you know, Hideaki Anno worked on this movie is like one of his his first known like animation cuts. He animated the God Warrior, right? Um, and like that cut like really stands out as like the the animation oh, yeah. moment that against is the everything big else. Fucking animation like, cut the movie. That, that's the th- yeah. That's the thing. Like st- stuff like Ponyo and like Spirited Away and and The Wind Rises. They all have like shit. Like it's like back to back. Like almost no break from how the fuck did you even animate that moments? But like Nasca comparing it to today's standards, it's mostly just the God Warrior part. That's like a well that. That is an all-time classic moment of, of yeah. and well, art. the reason I brought up that Hideaki Anno drew it is that he apparently took like he just saw an ad in the paper that they needed more animators, right? And, that's like, fucking took the legendary. Job. So, like, that's how short, like, that's how understaffed they must have been. That like they didn't have enough animators. They were like looking for new people to come work for them who were good enough, you know. And they happened to net this guy who kind of ones up everyone they actually had, you know. Uh, and then fucks off to go back to Gainax. Yeah, I have I have fucking seen that particular God Warrior animation like a hundred thousand times before even watching the movie. Uh, because of how great. many times we used it in my videos. Yeah, and just it's good. Yeah, I mean, I that's my other headcanon for this podcast <laughs> is that Hideki Anno literally is the God Warrior. Okay, so yeah, please like, explain this headcanon. I I just think that the personality <laughs> of that animation, like. That the oh, God yeah. Warrior yeah. is the same thing as Hideaki Anno. Like they're indistinguishable yeah. to me. Like you can tell he drew it when you think about it. And yeah. oh, like do you mean like Ava was the first blast and then the rebuild was the second one? Exactly. And then he dies? Like I mean, first of all, the fact that the Ava, like the Ava is obviously somewhat based on the God Warrior. Yeah, like, the Avas when they yeah. get released, they they have all this like goopy flesh and it's just it reminds yeah, it feels like yeah. the God it's like God Warriors put on a and suit of armor. Aside from the fact that Anno, you know, animated it, he also made the the God Warrior short film um in like twenty fourteen. The the movie there's a short film about if a God Warrior descends on Tokyo and it's just like seven minutes of a God Warrior fucking up Tokyo made with miniatures, Damn. which is what basically made Shin Godzilla possible. Like, I see. They made this short to show off that miniatures were still cool and this technology needed to be preserved, and that's why Shin Godzilla got made. The same uh, crew was brought on. But so, so like, yeah, he's clearly into the God Warriors, and uh, I also think it's interesting that the the way the God Warriors look and, and a lot of the look of the ships and stuff in this movie, I think is inspired by, like, Jules Verne kind of fantasy, like... 
20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. I know probably none of you have read any fucking... Neither have I read any of, like, 20s adventure serials or 1800s adventure stories Especially when you have, like, like, people, like, wearing suits, running around with steampunk guns on airships. It feels pretty, like, pulp. Or like pre yeah, well, or something like that. I mean, and that's a lot of what like the world masterpiece theater shows that Miyazaki worked on felt like that. Right. You know, like Future Boy Conan, the the TV series he directed not too long before this, and even Loop on the Third Castle of Cagliostro is very much a pulp caper kind of thing. So, like, I really think that like the 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 style of the technology and like the weaponry and everything was more based on that. And, yeah. like, the, the ships and stuff, whereas, like, you know, the, the biopunk aesthetic was applied to the environment, and then, right. like, the, the clothing and everything was more based on, like, ancient cultures on Earth that were of the same area the story is kind of supposed to be set. So it's, like, a really weird melting pot, and I think that's what makes it so iconic. And, like, I understand when, when someone looks at a movie like Ponyo, which is a technical marvel vastly beyond this movie in terms right, of animation. Yeah. Um, but, like, it is just set in Japan, and it's just, like, about a weird, wacky world where fish take over everything. So I get why some people would, like, consider this movie to be, like, vastly more imaginative Right, like, it's that, conceptually you know? a lot less ambitious, but, like, execution-wise, a lot greater. And I don't know if anything on the execution level of the last, like, four Miyazakis with the concept of something like Nasuka would even be possible by any studio that will ever be made. But, like... Yeah, there's, there's like, the moment in Ponyo where the fucking ocean goddess, like, sw- swims underneath all the boats would be, like, the equivalent of, like, if the giant horde of ohms were all very meticulously, intimately animated, if you know what I mean, right? Like, that's the level that we're talking about. There's a real funny moment towards the end of Nasca where an ohm is, like, walking away in the background while, like, just everything's kind of settling, like, the credits are rolling, and it's very apparent that it's, like, seven cells that are just kind of moved one at a time, you know? Yeah. Like, it's just, like, se- like each segment is its own cell, and they didn't really animate it so much as just scoot the cells along, you know? I, th- I thought that was clever. Oh, it I looks like cool. I-, I like it, and, I mean, it's a common technique, but, you know, it's just... It's it's just funny to think like it, they probably wouldn't have done that if they did this movie today, right? You know? Like cause yeah, they oh, yeah, could, yeah. Like in the beginning of the movie, animated. the ohm is just like a basically like a bunch of cardboard pieces that move in and out. Which I was surprised they yeah. weren't animated quite like that for the rest of the movie for the most part. But yeah, they they clearly like even by like uh, Spirit of the Way levels, like they were like, nope, we have a crazy animal with like five thousand different moving parts. Uh, we need five thousand guys. I would say please. pretty much. I would say everything from Princess Mononoke onwards is, like, another level. Like, yeah. basically, like, and not, to, I mean, Totoro it's, is another level up from this. Like, Totoro is already an unbelievably fucking beautiful movie. You know, it doesn't have that same shaky feel. Everything feels more yeah. completed and, like, detailed. But by the time you get to, like, Princess Mononoke onwards, it's like Ghibli is no longer on the same playing field. I have, like, a, a, not, like a not crazy thing to say. Like, if they made the movie today... You you were you were mentioning the soundtrack and yeah also when they were running away from the giant bug thing with shitter I was like man this this Sega Genesis soundtrack kicks ass and that was this movie is when I finally like decided to agree with you Digi your position on orchestral music because the experience of watching this film was a lot more unique than it would have been if it had a modern soundtrack and it frustrates me to to know to know that if they made the movie today it would almost certainly have a 90% orchestral soundtrack because they can afford it now, and they only used a MIDI soundtrack back then because they couldn't afford it. It, it It's definitely a shame. There was an episode of um, Review when they talked about Escape from New York, the, the Red Letter Media show. You just where, watched uh, that movie recently, by the way. Escape from New York is fucking stellar. I still haven't Cyborg. seen it, and I really would like to, but uh, they were discussing the soundtrack, and... Um, Jay really loved the soundtrack of the movie, which is composed by the director of the movie. Yes, um, John Carpenter. He also did yeah. that for Big Trouble in Little China, which is one of my favorite movie themes of all time. And and Mike was making the argument that he would rather it be scored by like a traditional score because he's just like more of a fan of that and considers it more timeless because he saw it as like this this other soundtrack sounds like cheesy 80s music, you know? And then he played like a side by side where he like rescored the scene and of course the 80s music is a thousand times better and more fitting because 
You cannot divorce a movie from the era it's made. It's always going to be obvious, no matter how hard you try, because the technology alone makes it obvious. Like, yeah, sound fidelity. Th- I mean, they don't make anime on cells anymore. So, like, when you're looking at an anime on cells, you already understand that it's from a certain time, and it feels more right and more complete for it to use music that, you know, that that was the interpretation of what sci-fi sounds like in that period, you know? And we understand that watching it back. And even outside of, you know, time periods and differences in technology, yeah. Now that, like, it just seems like every, like, audiovisual media, once it has the money to get an orchestra, it must get an orchestra. It just feels like, oh, everything we did before was just so undignified and bohemian and shit. And I'm, and I'm like... I I feel like soundtracks just are not respected in the same way that art and writing is now being respected in this fucking analysis explosion that we live in. People are like people think they're respecting it because they're just like, oh man, all this fancy fucking hebk euphonium going on, right? And I'm just like, no, there's so much more you can do with soundtracks, and I feel like people. I feel like there's a wide perception of OSTs as as just purely being in service of the work as basically a, a butt monkey to just like add in some flavor to the tone of the scene and to not be part of the art itself. And I find that... I think to, you might be right. And you know, I totally yeah. disagree with that whole thought process for sure. Right. It's the same thing with video games. Um, like I am, I am paying a guy to make music for video games I haven't even really started making yet because I'm like, the music of any game I make must be great and I need to take all the time it takes to make good melodies because I know that shit takes forever and I know that most games don't have good music because they just sort of like dump the duty of making the soundtrack toward the end. I was actually talking directly with with Florian Himsel, good you know fan and friend of the show, uh, like programmer for the original Binding of Isaac for people who don't you know haven't watched the episodes he was on. So like guy with actual industry experience and he told me like why are you t- talking about soundtracks now? Why not just make the whole game first and then do the soundtrack? And I'm just like, no, that's why soundtracks aren't good. That's why The Binding of Isaac doesn't have a soundtrack anyone remembers. It's just why like people people just don't give a shit. People just think, oh, people just think that the, the, the yes, orchestra is just the default, you know? And we're, you're missing out on so much. I'm with you, Devu. This is a point that I resonate with. Thank you. I... Yeah, I've always held the the thought that like sound is more important, if not, uh, it's as important, if not more important than visuals when it comes to anything. I I would say especially for a movie, a movies are like movies live and die on pacing most of the time, and music is like the beat. I I think one like vastly unappreciated part of movies is fully work and like sound sound effects True, and how yeah. those can like change it, scenes entirely. Nausicaa has great sound effects. I love all of the fucking, like, super cheesy, like, I love all those. They sound super old and iconic. There there is one sound effect that made me giggle because, like, one of the huge ships, like, that has, like, ski legs. I don't know how else to describe them. Like, you know, it's like a plane that has legs to land on that are like skis. And it lands, and it sounds like wheels, like, skirting rubber on pavement, <laughs> even though it's, like, skis landing on dirt. Um, it just it was really funny. Uh, warning, joke, do not pay attention. This will not be interesting. I think for the PCP anime movie, our soundtrack should be comprised of acapella and also Normal Boots intros-esque sounding chiptune rock. <laughs> yeah. End of joke. Continue podcast. I completely agree with that. Yeah, no, uh, the the sound of this movie is definitely great. Um, the animation is legendary. Uh, the shot compositions, there's a lot of really iconic-looking shots, not just backgrounds, great character animation moments, but the, one of the things that stuck out to me as someone who's watched every, every frame of painting video a thousand times is the very Akira Kurosawa-esque crowd shots where, yeah. like... They there's one moment where Nasca's about to like jump out of the plane after she's been saved by the um like the mother of the woman who died at the the start of the movie and like she's about to like jump out the hatch and everyone in the room is looking at her like and she turns back and it's just this really iconic shot of like her framed by like 30 people um 
it's cool shit, and it reminded me of Kurosawa, even though I haven't seen any of his movies. I've just seen the Every Frame of Painting video. About At least him. on one occasion, I picked up, like, it even helps you, like, tell the story, I guess probably in every fucking scene, but, like, the one that stood out to me was, uh, yeah, when she gets abducted by the fucking more fanatical society, and she then gets rescued out of her little prison cell by some of the, you know, the, just the uh, everyday onlookers, who were like, yeah, we're totally on your side. We're going to bust you out of here. And these characters did not have a scene before this and no lines of dialogue, but you saw them in the airship reacting to everything and kind of getting a vibe on, like, what they were feeling. And clearly that hinge not just on like the facial expressions of the people looking through those little windows it was also like the framing and like the body language and everything so yeah really fucking important to the story it means you can like get shit done uh, all in one scene and i mean for what it's worth all of those characters would be more fleshed out in the manga like that the 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 the, the people who help her escape there will all be important later in the story but like that's why they would be so detailed and like show up so much throughout the scene I um I want to get this out of my head before I fall asleep. Uh, this this one uh, observation the the only like new thing that I noticed about the film. And this is sort of like not related to anything anybody was just saying. Uh, but it was the thing that Davu noticed as well that um the Valley of the Wind people have big bushy beards and mustaches. Yes, the mustaches are fucking ludicrous. They're 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 huge and fat, and and the the nations of the other people, the men don't have beards, they don't have mustaches, and just so happens that the the Valley of the Wind people live near the forest, so they know what it is, and they know the spores, and they know all the stuff. So I feel I I, I head cannoned in my brain that they must grow their beards bigger because um it's like a natural filter for the spores, like uh, as a back. At what point in the movie did you develop that head 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 cannon? Uh, I think it was just when I realized all of the characters in the Valley of the Wind had beards. Yeah, and for mustaches. me it was when yeah the great swordsman sits sits right next to the king. To the king, that's and it's what like, I wrote. Yeah, both have the same in my notes fucking too. beard, right? They have the same fucking beard, and I'm guessing that uh, whatever the uh, Lord Dupa's uh, hairstyle, this weird like you know shaven on both sides but not down the middle, probably has something to do with comfortably getting the helmets on and stuff. So yeah, the the beards, the mustaches were probably a world building consideration. So that was pretty cute yeah i like world builders. another great world building consideration around that part is when um when lord yupa comes to the village there's like a brief scene where some random woman comes up to him and is like this this is like a newborn baby of the village will you give him like a strong name her it was a girl <laughs> uh, whatever give her a strong name like i thought that scene was really great for establishing like what kind of reputation yupa has that like yeah. this is how people see this guy is like oh he's in town let me go fucking run by the latest baby and get like the local <laughs> badass to name him before he can fucks off again you know and we never know we if never know die. what the we never hear the name Plot hole. He never says it. <laughs> no, not a plot hole. I just want to know. Zero. Is he gonna na- is is he gonna name it Nausicaa after the the prophecy? I girl? hereby dub you Studio Ghibli. I I also had written down. Um, I like that Nausicaa is one of the is a is a uh, a heroine who hurts people and gets hurt a lot. Yeah. And you don't see a lot of female characters who get, like, I mean, it's more common nowadays because everyone's trying to make that point, but, like, Nasca kick not only hurts people very badly, which is probably why, like, Disney would would probably have a difficult time, like, actually marketing her as, like, a Disney princess, even though her and Kushana technically are Disney princesses in a way. Yeah. But, uh, but, yeah, she does, like, literally murder people at the beginning and uh, like you could it, it's ambiguous whether she killed anybody but like one of the guys on the floor there's like blood down the wall like from his face yeah. like she definitely fucked him up and she gets like shot twice there's a lot of blood yeah uh so then you also wrote that the incomplete god warrior is a metaphor for the incompleteness of the story which yeah i guess that makes a lot of sense I definitely think, because in the original, well, not technically original, but in the manga, the God Warriors are built up to through the entire story. Like, they do not show up to the very end of Volume 7, and so I really think that in the context of the movie, they just hadn't earned it. Like, 
the God Warrior showing up would have felt out of left field because it's like such a massively, like a huge power spike, you know, to happen at this point in the story. Um, so the idea that like the the God Warrior as a concept is literally not fleshed out in this movie. It's not so fleshed, yeah. We're just going to throw him in because like we have to have some indication of it because it's like the most iconic imagery of the story. But like how can we incorporate it in this much smaller version of this epic war tale. Uh, I guess we'll just have like a half, a half complete one, like fire a beam and then just die. And like, that's kind of interesting in its own way of like having that be all the weapon amounted to was just like this barely like alive fucking weird creature. Um, incidentally, Hyperlight Drifter, like the entire fucking aesthetic of that game is oh, just the God Warriors. Like, shit. The, the imagery right. of the dead God Warrior is like everywhere in that game. Yeah, that's the kind of that's the kind of uh, you know when Hippo said Miyazaki movies are very inspirational to any artist. That is very much what it's like. It's similar to how like I've heard some people say that like a lot of the classical. Uh, compositions a lot of the old symphonies they contain so much shit that like entire genres be spawned fucking from, like, canon indeed parts. like the, yeah. the song uh yeah. canon is like basically all of pop music yeah miyazaki some of those movies can sort of be like that for like artists you know like some rinky dink indie studio it's just like well how much aesthetics do we have Let's just take one thing from a Miyazaki movie yeah. and make that us. And make that the entire game, yeah. Um, I have written down that uh, I really like that the weapons are all made of ceramics. I don't remember if they actually say that in the it's movie. Very but unique, like, yeah. That's how you... I love that, like, all the swords are drawn in that way where, like, everything's kind of a knife. Everything's very thin and, like white blades yeah. it's wouldn't very wouldn't be surprised if it was different. just because Miyazaki was like that'd be a really cool like type of weapon not like the oh, big yeah. dirty gray shit just like all like clean and shiny it makes like a ting sound it'd be like so fucking cool guys like I'm just gonna like totally like have a reason why they have to always use them and not just regular steel yeah that's another element that I think just harkens to like the genre-ness of it that like you know it is supposed to be just like a unique 80s fantasy epic you know on some level and like or, or, or even borrowing from, like, those old travel epics. And it's, like, that you have to have your iconic item. Just like how Frodo has, like, that sword that, you know, that can have replicas made of it forever. Everything in this movie is very well marketed, by which I just mean good. Like, yeah. the best marketing is just to have the strongest iconography. And then you can market it forever because it's super fucking memorable. Indeed. And Ghibli does use that as marketing. Like, they sell products of everything from their movies. That fucking little kid singing the la 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 song was. I was really annoyed that they never sang it on key at any one point. It was always off on one of the notes. That song is weird as fuck. I am undecided how I feel about it. Like, it's a little too cheesy, I think. Like, if I feel like it should have been like the kid sings it or whatever, but then there's like an orchestral version of it yeah. that is not out of tune, but they, they never do that. It's always just the kid. Yeah, that's a little weird. Um, I, I have written down, speaking of kids, the the little girl at the end of the movie, like, screams out, Hime Nesama. That's how she refers to Nasuka, which would translate to, like, s princess big sister. Right. And, like, none of the versions of the movie I watched, like, translated it as anything other than just the princess. Because, like, there's no comfortable way to translate that in English. But I just thought it said a lot about how, like, Nasuka is perceived, right. you know, that... Even though she's acknowledged as a princess, she's also big sis. I mean, it still came through just in the way that... Really all in that first scene. Like, it's all about showing you uh, that this is a small village, so it has sort of a family vibe to it, but she's yeah. still also pr princess. I also wrote down that she does literally murder herself at the end. She, like, straight up just stands there, arms open, and gets fucking squat... Like, like knocked thousands of feet through the air by the ohm, like ostensibly yeah. dead probably did die and then they kind of like brought her back like ash ketchum style yeah i was gonna say like they totally ripped off pokemon the first movie the ohms did they must have been like <laughs> what, what the, the fuck, fuck? we'll totally do that scene guys like seriously i when when the guy was uh, the ohm was like bringing her up very very slowly above everything i was exp i wasn't expecting this but i was imagining that he just let her drop and just looked at and did it again <laughs> like playing with her corpse damn and then everyone watching was like oh 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 let's go this is fucked up <laughs> that would be weird 
and then they eat her. So my last note and my biggest complaint about the movie is that it does just kind of end. Like, yeah. you blink and it's just over. Like, she saves the Valley of the Wind, and there's just, like, a few shots of, like, okay, here's everybody else, uh, it's over. And, like, it feels, again, I do feel like the movie left, it leaves a lot of unanswered questions, and kind of sweeps it under the rug because that last scene is so long. Like, it feels like a lengthy, proper climax, and it only really deals with the relevant characters. You know, like, Kusharna only sort of steps in to do the God Warrior thing, and it's kind of like, here, she did have something to do in the story. But it, again, like, none of the characters' arcs really go anywhere, except for Nasca. It, it They just kind of made it a story about saving the Valley of the Wind because there needed to be an ending. And that scene doesn't even, like, involve the Valley of the Wind in the manga. It's just, like, an unrelated battle scene that happens to have this moment in it where, you know, she does sacrifice herself and get, you know, lifted up by the Omu and all that, but it's not in service of saving the Valley. That is just, like, a circumstance invented so the movie can have an ending that has any emotional connection to Nasca at all, you know? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, I got more re- resolution than I was actually expecting. Like, about a third of the way into it, I'm like, okay, this movie is setting up so much shit that there's no way it's gonna actually like be what ending any of it. What the fuck is this image you posted? What's going on? <laughs> I have to put this on screen. <laughs> oh god. Wait. What? What's where? going on? In the Google Doc <laughs> notes, it must have been Munchie. Huh? What? Oh what you shit. Just, <laughs> I just closed the notes. What is this okay. shit? I I I, 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 I Google searched Na- uh, Nasuka Valley of the Wind ass. That's what I got. <laughs> yeah. What the fuck? I'm putting it on. It'll be on screen in the pod. <laughs> I didn't even realize it was a notes document. All right, that's it for the first episode of the Ghibli cast, I guess. This is great. As you all know, this movie is a 10 out of 10. It's a Ghibli movie. Of course it's good. I mean, obviously. Duh. I, I like I, my my overall review of this movie is I don't really think it is fully functional as a movie, but as a moment to moment experience, it's enjoyable. It's like yeah. you just every scene is so complete and you, you just kind of experience a full reality of a scene and you think like, wow, that was a neat thing that happened. That that chase with the giant bug or that aerial battle or that like scene of Nasca doing something heroic that sure was cool and then the movie just kind of ends and you're like well <laughs> you know like i guess i'll watch the next one yeah i i would agree with that 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 boy character i thought i could swear he was like a love interest but i guess he just doesn't do a th- single no. thing i think not, he's presented yeah. I, I like more that's, that way in the long i world. i feel that way about everyone but I, here i'm i'm not here to be the bad guy and to say that this movie is bad cuz again i don't think it's bad it's just a matter of I'm I'm not attracted to the aesthetic or anything about the movie whatsoever. I don't think that it's where's bad. Frog I Fractions it. Two. Yeah, w- yeah. Where's yeah. Frog Fractions Two? Is how I feel about this. All movie. right. Well, so the next move, the next uh, Ghibli movie we're going to talk about is going to be Castle in the Sky. Just don't don't so, worry, I won't be on that one. Everyone who's mad in the yeah. comments. I I liked having you on this because I mean, like I obviously didn't we don't want to be on. I didn't want to be on. I said I won't be on, guys. And then he was like, No, God, no, Munchie, come on. I just think that it's important to represent. Like, the breadth of ways that people engage with these movies because of the fact that, like, a lot of people... Like, if we made a podcast that was just, like, me and Devu being like, here's everything that's amazing about Nasca, then any kid who watches it who doesn't really like the movie and we'll doesn't really get why, yeah. like... Yeah, they're like, well, I didn't enjoy it. Like, okay, everything you guys are saying sounds true, but, like, I still thought the movie was boring. And Th- like, That's how I felt about this entire podcast. They're just like, yeah, I mean... Okay, but well, like, m- my review of the I movie is I don't know how many rewatches it could hold up on because I end up really just connecting with this idea of it being this like literalization of environmentalist desires, I guess you know, and I I don't I don't know how long that kind of appeal can last in me. Like it's not a movie I want to watch again right now. I I definitely felt like because I had seen it fairly recently, I felt like I was rewatching it too soon watching it again like not to say that i didn't enjoy it but it was like i didn't need 
to experience this version of Nasca again so soon, especially when I still haven't reread the manga, which is one of my favorite manga. So like, I lo- I do legit consider the manga not maybe not a ten out of ten, but close to it. It's it's one of my favorites. But again, so much of what it gets into is like much bigger, broader political intrigue that has time to yeah, build. Yeah, you've definitely sold me. I would have liked have. to have read it before this. Uh, but, I mean, you know, I didn't want us to talk too manga. much about it because of the this fact that it's cast, just a whole other podcast. Cast. And anybody who watched, yeah, that that too. But anybody who was in the podcast who had just seen the movie would have nothing to contribute to that. And I, I think I exhausted talking about it more than I even probably should have in the span of this. True. But anyways, the next one's Castle in the Sky, and I'm gonna have a gimmick on this show because of the fact that I had those weird head cannons for Nasca. Um, if you have weird head cannons for Castle in the Sky, if you just happen to have them, don't try to make up new bullshit. Just if you happen to have them, post them in the comments, and maybe they will be read if I think they are interesting or funny. If you have like, or if you have like an analytical point you don't think I'd bring up, just like okay, tell me, there we go. bring up yeah. stuff you want me to talk about about Castle in the Sky that you think is unique and if there's anything that i i want to say i'll i'll bring it up on the show that's but like, interesting we're just off we're just becoming fucking jack films offshoring half the work to the audience yeah well i'm i i historically histor i will say this that uh and i'll i'll lead into the next podcast with this i have seen castle in the sky twice both in very bad circumstances once was like on tv with commercial breaks and the other was huh. like with my ex-girlfriend and neither one of us was paying attention. So, like, I don't like the movie, but I'm looking to have that opinion swayed by watching it again. But if I end up not liking it, I'd like for there to be, like, commenters who uh, could tell me good... I remember really liking it, so I I will be there for that opinion piece. Watch Chibibakas. It's also an anime show. Me and him Things are about on the it, movie except and maybe I'm not my weird and I don't more. say anything. I'm hugely interested. In every show is like a brain blast and it's Kino. Have and you done more than one of those? Have you recorded a second one? Yeah. We've done three. The second one's coming yeah, out. It, it, like, like, What's like, it really about? Soon. What's the second episode it's, about? It, it's about Kari Kano. And I have an oh, existential sick. meltdown because I think... I didn't realize, I like, you know, the, like, huh, anime is bad. is like, an absolute, like, lie and corruption of the youth. And, in fact, anime is Kino, and it is perfect. And Kari Kano has made me, like, feel alive again after watching 6 out of 10 Marvel movies. And I watch Kari Kano, and I feel like my heart's beating, like I belong in the world. Thank I God. I'm so glad that young people can catch on to Kari Kano, because that show has literally been underrated, rather, for right. two decades. Oh, oh, uh, Munchy, you said there was two scenes near, near the end that gave you a pulse, and Nasca was the God Warrior seen one of them uh i i said it was uh it was when nasca gets her her butt at uh, her butt acid ah, and uh, I see. when the when the town gets pillaged and ah, there, it would have been so sad. appropriate if it had been the god warrior scene because that's also fucking hideakiano doing it like, well I, that was also cool you. but also yeah. i still didn't care still didn't care all right. Well, all right. Uh, I have no idea when the Castle in the Sky podcast will actually drop, so I encourage the audience to just watch the movie whenever, and you'll you'll it, it won't be so long that you'll have forgotten it, unless you really don't like it. Uh, so yeah, that that'll be that. But I'm about to move, so I can't make any guarantees.